Amazing. So, <laughs> welcome to the Marine Life Talks. Um, as you've noticed, I have a Bee Gees mic again this month. This is because we're using a different recording system. I'm not going to do karaoke. I'm safe. It's fine. Um, so, before I introduce the speaker this month, a few housekeeping issues. Um, I'm hoping all of you have signed in out the front. That's so you know who's here in case of a fire. If you haven't signed in, we won't know you're here and you may burn, and that's fine. Just sign in next month, no problems. Um, if you have a hearing aid, please switch it to Loop T. That will enhance your acoustics this evening, apparently. I haven't tried it, but I'm sure it's fine. Um, we don't have any disabled individuals, so we don't need to worry about access. In the very unlikely event of a fire or other emergency, please leave the building the way you came in, unless it was via the lift, in which case, please go down the nearest stairs. Move the glass stairs around by the gate where you came into the main sort of complex. So I won't do too much of an introduction this evening because I'm pretty sure Jen would like to introduce herself. Um, this is Jen Durden. Um, she will be joining the team for the Marine Life Talks, if you like. And this is her kind of introductory lecture. So without any further ado, I give you Jen. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Durden. Uh, please pardon the Canadian accent. Um, you might think in some ways that I am not probably the best person to be speaking about plastic pollution in the ocean, um, not least because I grew up about a 20-hour drive from the nearest ocean. Um, but um, I'm hoping that um, I know enough about the topic to keep you interested. Um, it's certainly something that's interested me for a while. And my undergraduate degree is uh, in chemical engineering. And for my fourth year research project, I spent several months in the lab um, trying to produce plastics of different textures and trying to control the properties that we get out of plastics. Um, so I, I'm kind of interested in them for that reason. Um, following my engineering degree, I spent eight or nine years working uh, doing contaminated land remediation. Um, and from that, I became interested in doing port cleanups and ocean -y types of things. So now I'm here doing a PhD. However, it is not in pollution, it's um, in deep sea ecology. So um, I hope that's convinced you completely that I'm totally unqualified for giving this talk. Um, but we will press on anyways. Um, plastic pollution uh, is something that isn't really being worked on a whole lot here at the Oceanography Center. Um, it is being studied by several other large oceanographic institutions on the planet. Um, probably the largest project is called the CPLEX project, project which is just um, finishing up. And that's being run out of uh, the Scripps Oceanographic Institution in California. Um, so if you're interested in more information after today's talk, I would encourage you to check them out online. They've got a fabulous blog of all the things they've been doing um, to assess plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, so before we begin, um, who here has heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or the Pacific Plastic Vortex, as it's called? OK, almost everybody in here. Great. Um, well, that's, that's good and bad. Um, I would say the interesting thing about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is that almost all the information that's out there about it is false. Um, so if you were to search for the Great Pacific Plastic uh, Patch, Garbage Patch online, uh, you might get this picture up. Yeah, you've seen that before, have you? And in fact, on greatpacificgarbagepatch.info, this is the picture they give you to show you what the Great Pacific Garbage Patch looks like. Uh, this is not it. This is a picture of a man um, rowing his way through a seaway in Manila in the Philippines. So it's not actually in the middle of the ocean at all. Um, but I think this picture really um, shows the three major misnomers or misconceptions about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, the first is that um, it's a giant island of garbage, uh, which it's not. Um, secondly, that um, you can see everything floating. It's recognizable objects, things you might be identify, able to identify. Like in this picture, you can see there's lots of takeaway trays and some plastic um, plates and um, carrier bags and all sorts of um, objects that we're familiar with in everyday life. And the third thing about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is that um, people think that it's been towed out there and dumped, uh, that this is our um, waste disposal site, as it were, for a variety of countries. Uh, and that's not true either. Um, so you might think from those misconceptions that uh, it would be like this man, that you would go to sail across the Pacific and you'd run into this. 
um, which you won't. Um, sorry to disappoint. Um, and the other thing is that um, there's this number bandied about that says that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas, um, which is about five and a half times the size of the UK. And uh, this number, it's almost like a, I'm not sure what you call it here. In Canada, we call it, let's say, game telephone. I think it's called whispers here, where you tell somebody and they tell somebody else and they tell somebody else. This number that says it was twice the size of Texas was invented by someone who thought if they took all the plastic in the ocean and they were to iron it into a great giant piece, that's how big it would be. But, of course, um, that's not what the plastic's like in the ocean at all. So, uh, that's a bit of a silly number. Um, so, today, instead of talking about misconceptions, even though I've spent a good five minutes on it now, um, we're going to talk about what the plastic in the ocean is actually like, um, what it might look like if you were out in this Great Pacific garbage patch, um, what some of the effects are of this plastic on the environment out there, and um, what some solutions are to this big problem. So first, um, what do we know about plastic? Um, and then secondly, what do we know about plastic in the ocean? Um, if you take your plastic water bottle, I'm sure somebody's got one here today, um, and add it to the ocean, what happens to the plastic? And also, what happens to the ocean? So first, let's talk a bit about plastic. Um, in Southampton here, our recycling scheme says you can put plastic bottles in the recycling bank, but they don't use the numbers. But on other parts of the planet, um, their recycling is based on these numbers that are on the bottom of the bottle. They're called plastic resin codes, and um, they tell you about the type of plastic that there is. There's six types of plastics, um, ranging in different flexibilities and textures based on what they're made out of. So we've got, you know, your regular plastic water bottle. Uh, milk jugs and carrier bags are actually made out of the same kind of plastic. Uh, shampoo bottles is vinyl, something different. Um, Low-density polyethylene, that's your squeezy ketchup or squeezy mustard or honey bottles. Um, yogurt pots, something different entirely. Um, polystyrene cups, which aren't really in use as much anymore. Um, and then category number seven is um, mixtures of the first two kinds, or first six kinds of plastic, so any mixture of the above. Um, and that includes things like the large um, multi-gallon water jugs that you would put on your water cooler in the office. So, um, obviously you can make lots of different kinds of products out of plastic. It's an extremely versatile, useful material. Um, it's light. It's, it can be very flexible, it can also be very rigid, um, it's very durable, um, and it can be molded into a variety of very convenient shapes. So uh, those are all really useful to us as humans. Um, I'm sure if you think back to what you've done today, that you've had objects from at least three of these categories. Um, I know this morning, if I think about my morning, I got up and I was wearing pajamas that were made out of polyester, so those are plastic. And um, I got out of bed and stepped onto my carpet, that's plastic. And then I walked downstairs into the bathroom and got into the bathtub, which is plastic, and used the shower, which is plastic, and um, washed my hair with shampoo out of a plastic bottle, and then brushed my teeth with a plastic toothbrush from toothpaste out of a plastic tube. You get the idea, I'm sure you did something similar this morning. Um, so there's a lot of plastic involved in our daily lives. Um, the most important thing, I, I think, about this is that it's convenience. Um, plastic wasn't around, it certainly wasn't ubiquitous about 60 years ago, um, and yet in that short period, we've managed to fill our lives with plastic. Um, so that's a testament to its usefulness and um, also shows our dependence on it. In fact, uh, there's an estimate that says that 17% of the oil produced on the planet is used to make plastic, and most of that is used in the first world. So, with those... Um, properties in mind about plastic, let's talk about how much plastic there is in the ocean. And I love this picture because I think it just shows how convenient plastic is. I mean, there's water bottles and juice containers, Coke bottles. Okay, there's a pizza box, that's not plastic. But um, it's in a plastic bin that is lined with a plastic bag. Everything in this picture is plastic. Um, so that just shows how much our, our society loves the convenience of plastic. Um, on the planet, we produce about 200 to 300 million tons of plastic every year, um, and that includes one trillion carrier bags, um, which is a bit of an upsetting number, um, and that was back in 2008. We've increased since then. In fact, 35% of the plastic that we use is, uh, make is used in packaging. That's quite a lot. 
Um, it's a bit tough to tell how much of that gets into the ocean. We do know a few things. We know, um, one, that uh, every person on average on the planet throws out 84 kilograms of plastic every year. So I'm, I'm not sure how much you weigh, but that's more than the average adult human being. Um, and if you think about the fact that that's averaged over lots of places on the planet where they don't have access to plastic, um, that means that us in this room probably throw out quite a bit more than that. Um, and another group has estimated that we throw out 1,500 water bottles every second. Um, so I'm sure that means that we've thrown out at least 15,000 in the last, since I changed the last slide. Um, so there's a lot of plastic bottles. Um, a recent study says that um, out of the plastic that we produce, 5% of it is recovered for recycling. 50% is either landfilled or incinerated, and the rest, we don't know the fate of it. Um, now, some of that remainder will be um, in long-term plastic uses, like, for example, your refrigerator or your washing machine has some plastic parts, and you probably don't throw that out um, very often. Um, so there's definitely plastic in existence in long-term uses, but um, the majority of our plastic is single-use in intent. Um, we don't have a number on exactly how much gets into the ocean, but we do know from measurements um, out in the Pacific, in the area of this Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that um, in the last 40 years we've had a hundredfold increase in the number of pieces of plastic that are out there. And um, in 2001, it was estimated that um, the number of pieces per square kilometer was 334,000. So that's, that's a lot of plastic. Um, right, so let's talk a bit about uh, how it gets into the ocean. So there's two main routes that the plastic goes to get there. Um, this is the one we think of most on the left. Um, so ocean-based plastic. This is things like um, fishing implements, uh, from industrial activity straight into the ocean, um, dumping or shipping. This is uh, the wreck of the ship that was um, beached off New Zealand last year. Uh, lost, it lost, uh, lost loads of its um, containers into the ocean. They're often full of plastic goods. Um, and the other option is uh, land-based through watersheds, um, dump sites that are on the coast, uh, industrial outfalls, and beach litter. So. How much do you think comes from each of these sources? Well, I hope that you're marginally surprised, as I was, to find out that 80% of the plastic in the ocean, debris in the ocean, comes from land. It's mostly not from our shipping, um, which is a bit surprising. Um, in fact, the photo on the right is a picture of the Los Angeles River um, near where it meets the ocean, and this plastic is all from one storm event that came down. They spend in excess of $200 million a year cleaning the garbage out of this river, um, which is a bit sad. And they've estimated that it's more than 100,000 kilos of plastic that come down this particular river every year into the ocean. Um, so that's, that's a lot of plastic. I don't know, 100,000 kilos. I, I was trying to find some analogy for that, but it's just such a big number. I don't, can't think of how many elephants that is or, or anything. Um, yeah. On a sort of corollary thought, um, I just had a look. Um, there was a beach watch. The uh, Marine Conservation Society of the UK did a beach watch a few weeks ago uh, where they cleaned up beaches around here. And they, at that time, published um, data from last year's beach cleanup, and their top 10 items that were found on beaches in the UK were uh, pieces of plastic, plastic caps or lids, polystyrene pieces, plastic wrappers, plastic string, drinks bottles, glass, cotton bud sticks, fishing net, and plastic cutlery and cups. So um, nine out of those 10 are all made out of plastic. Um, so I'm sure you can think of some time in the last week when you've used at least one of those items. I certainly have. Um, so that definitely shows how much rubbish in our daily life ends up on the beach, um, which means at some point it probably ends up in the ocean. So once it gets into the ocean, where does it go? Uh, I will put a little disclaimer in here. I'm not a physical oceanographer, but um, hopefully I can explain the basics to this without too much um, trouble. Um, has anybody been watching the news about um, the debris from the Japanese tsunami last year? So today, did you see the news item about this 160-ton pier that's landed in California? It's just amazing to me that something that heavy could have been brought all the way across the ocean. It's made out of concrete and steel, and they're having to employ police to keep um, kids from climbing on it because it's so cool. Um, 
So that came by a currents across the ocean. Um, there's lots of other examples of other um, items coming across the ocean. In fact, uh, the first man to model um, ocean currents in relation to debris, um, or the man who was most uh, prolific at it, is a guy named Curtis Ebbesmeyer. He's an American. And um, I guess in 1991, he was walking along a beach. Um, and I remember this happening. I went to the beach the same summer, it must have been. Um, there was a, a container ship that lost a load of Nike trainers. Well, three container ships full of Nike trainers. And um, they washed up on the west coast of North America. So for me at the beach, it was on Vancouver Island. And for him, it was somewhere closer to California. But, you know, I remember the day I went, it was like people running around, anybody got a right? I need size eight, whatever, looking for a pair. And um, he thought, oh, I can trace this. So um, luckily for him, Nike is, is um, very careful about um, knowing the barcodes of every item that gets shipped across the planet. So he determined that one out of these three containers had been lost at sea, and the other two had jettisoned their load, and he figured out where it had been lost and how the currents had transported these trainers around the planet. Um, and then, you know, once he'd sort of worked on that, he decided to make a multi-year model. So he's able to model where debris flows and collects around the planet. <laughs> So this, this is a very long introduction to say something incredibly simple, which is that um, the currents, which are shown in blue on here, um, create gyres. So that's areas where cur there's current around, swirling around, sort of like in your toilet. Um, and in the middle, unlike your toilet, it's calm. There's no currents. So that tends to be where debris collects. Um, so there's sort of five of these gyres, which is why they call them the Great Pacific Plastic Gyres. Um, North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. So all of these circles on this map are represented by this. So they're, um, they're called convergence zones by most scientists rather than um, garbage patches. Within those, um, due to seasonality of winds and currents, effects like El Nino, local topography, islands, um, atolls, things like that, the um, debris that collects in there can be um, quite non-uniformly distributed and also change concentration quite often. So it can be a little bit difficult to follow where they are. I mean, it's kind of a big place. Um, so. Um, they have put quite a bit of, although they put quite a bit of study into this, they can't necessarily always tell exactly where the debris is going to be from year to year. Um, having said that, the North Pacific is the most studied um, for several reasons. Um, the biggest one being that uh, the U.S. has put the most money into um, studying this problem. And since Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific and lots of Hawaiian beaches get covered in rubbish every year, um, they're trying to sort that out. So. There are these five basic gyres, um, although some of them, like say the North Pacific one, has an east patch and a west patch that collect, um, collect debris. So what does the plastic look like when it's out there? Um, well, there's you know, very familiar big pieces, um, things like domestic um, materials like this, these two bottles here. One's been had a bit of wave action or UV action breaking it up, and the other one is uh, just a bit covered in stuff. Or most of the pieces out there are actually less than a centimeter in diameter. Uh, so this is a picture that was taken um, by the Cplex crew of plastic that they um, trolled out of the Pacific a couple of summers ago. And I think it's kind of interesting because it shows a few different types of small pieces. Um, the most common are those three pieces or four pieces on the right. Those are fragments of larger um, items that have been broken up at sea, mostly by waves and um, also by some UV. This item, very suspiciously round, second from the left, is what they call a nurdle. Um, and that's a pre-production plastic. So um, when they make plastic uh, in some parts of the world, they make these nurdles, and then they ship them in containers to other parts of the world where then they're injection molded to make whatever item they really want. Um, so the raw materials generally travel around the planet like this. And they estimate that um, out of all the marine debris on the planet, 90% of it is plastic and 10% of it is nurdles. Um, so the other kind of microplastic, which I don't have a picture up here, which is a bit too bad, um, is the little tiny beads um, like that you get in your face wash. You know, they say it's uh, exfoliating or whatever. It's got little plastic beads in it. Um, and they also use it in industrial applications. Um, instead of sandblasting, they plastic blast your boat to keep it from being fouled and things like that. Um, so those micro microbeads are also found in the ocean. Um, so I think um, the interesting piece of, inf piece of information about this is that um, the plastic is quite small pieces. Um, and because of this, it 
floats in the surface, but based on surface area and density, it will float at different depths. So it won't, it's not all on the surface, it's sort of in the top bit of the water column. And um, because of that, it's diffuse. And uh, because it's diffuse and very small, we can't actually map uh, this from space like we do with other things like plankton blooms and stuff like that. Um, so we're unable to use aerial techniques for estimating the size of this plastic jar, which makes it a bit tricky to find. Um, yeah, so what does it look like? If you were to go out into the Pacific to look at this, this is what it looks like. Not exactly what the, uh, like the first picture we saw with the man in the canoe, is it? Um, so this is the picture they took um, looking over the side of the boat in the middle of the Northeast Pacific Convergence Zone, as they call it. Um, so you can see there's little pieces of plastic, and some of them are like this one are right on the surface, and then some uh, to the right you can see are a little bit farther down in the water column. Um, so it's kind of like a plastic soup as opposed to a giant um, island of rubbish. Um, and I would be remiss as a deep sea ecologist if I didn't talk about what it was like in the deep sea. And I'm quite sorry to say that um, we don't actually know that much about it. We do know that plastic um, sinks either when it gets waterlogged or when it gets so covered in biota that the mass of it changes. Um, so that's when it falls to the seafloor. Most of the places on the planet, like under the convergent zones in the middle of the ocean, are really far from land and really deep. Um, and so we don't usually go looking for plastic there, or at least they haven't expanded the studies to that. But I can show you this picture, which made me chuckle. Uh, this is uh, the railing from a bench on a Titanic with a plastic cup in the bottom, or two plastic cups, um, which did make me feel a little bit sad. That's a bit soul destroying. But this is one of the few pieces of information we have about the deep sea um, in the abyss and uh, plastic that's down there. For the ecologists in the room, note the squat lobster here too. That made, me, made my day. Um, other people might not be as excited about it. Right. Um, we do know a few things about some parts of the deep sea. For example, um, this afternoon I heard a lecture about a woman who is uh, looking at litter in the deep Mediterranean. Um, and that's quite interesting because, I mean, if I think plastics last forever, I mean, she found some 6,000-year-old um, olive oil amphora, right? Um, so th those have been there quite a long time, uh, certainly longer than either the Titanic or this plastic cup. Um, so there are people that are looking at litter there, not necessarily specifically plastic, like they are in the convergence zones in the Pacific. Um, but it, it's an area of research, and we don't really have a lot of conclusions right now. So... Now that I've bored you to death with the physical aspects of plastic, let's talk about um, what happens to it in the marine environment. And I'm not going to talk a lot about beaches um, because that's something that I think is uh, fairly well known. You can see that when you go to the beach here, um, effects on animals. I'm gonna talk mostly about the pelagic environment. So uh, the first um, sad bit of news is entanglement. Um, this here is a picture of a ghost net which means that it's a cast-off fishing net that's just left to drift, um, and whatever animals happen to be unlucky will end up caught in the net. Um, this usually means that um, they choke if they're some kind of mammal because they can't get back to the surface, um, or for other animals, uh, they're unable to move to escape predation or to forage for food, so they either starve or are eaten by somebody else. Um, or lastly, they uh, sustain injuries from attempting to free themselves from this and um, bleed to death from their injuries. Um, or they've spent so much energy trying to get out of this thing that they have no energy left um, afterwards. So, uh, sad set of scenarios there. Um, generally, we find uh, fish and mammals or turtles are the things that are most involved in these. Uh, you can see lots of these drift nets end up with like a little community. There's a community of jacks here that are hanging around the uh, bottom of this net because something got caught in there and something else decided to eat it and something else decided to eat them. And you end up kind of with this group of sort of mini ecosystem following this thing around. Um, it's not just fishing nets that are involved in entanglement. Um, also packing bands, uh, elastic bands, rope, um, those evil six-pack plastic things that come around your tins of beer. Um, yeah, and uh, it's an unfortunate 
I said I wasn't going to talk about beaches. It's an unfortunate um, thing as well that there's lots of plastic rubbish on beaches and that affects nesting birds there. Um, both chicks and adults become entangled in the plastic on the beach. Don't survive. Uh, another sad picture here. This is a stellar sea lion who has died um, whilst trying to free himself from the net in Alaska. Um, it's actually a surprising number of mammals. They uh, um, estimate um, NOAA, which is the American Ocean and Atmospheric Association. Um, they estimate that 100,000 um, marine mammals a year um, are entangled, dive entanglement. And that's just from the reports that they get. They have like a scheme for fishermen to call in if they found entangled mammals. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to bird deaths, they think about... Uh, 30% of the gannet deaths um, in Germany along the German coast are due to entanglement. So that's quite a lot. Uh, ingestion. This is another problem we have with plastic. Unfortunately, plastic looks really tasty in the ocean. Um, for turtles, uh, they think that plastic looks like jellyfish, and so they often eat it. Um, there's a man in the U.S. who's a, a sea turtle specialist, marine biologist. His name's Wallace Nichols. Um, you can find him online if you're interested. Uh, he has a project where he goes around uh, looking at turtles and pulling plastic bags out their bums um, to keep them uh, from dying from it. The main problem, of course, with ingestion um, is uh, malnutrition. Uh, plastic doesn't give them anything. It um, can lead to starvation because of blockage of the digestive tract. Um, animals are unable to ingest anything with good nutritive value. Um, it also blocks the excretory system, so even if they're able to eat properly, they can't pass any of that material out of their bodies. Um, so um, it's generally due to clogging. That's the main problem. Um, this is a picture of an Albus Trost chick, um, which is also all over the internet if you're looking for it. Um, Albatross are, are quite indiscriminate when it comes to their plastic um, diet. They'll eat pretty much anything, toothbrushes, caps, condoms, pens, rubber bands, anything you can find, really. Um, and unfortunately, um, albatross then regurgitate their food to their chicks, so they'll pass the plastic onto the chicks, and the chicks are unable to regurgitate, so once they've had plastic, they can't get rid of it like the parents can. And they um, estimate that 40% of albatross chick deaths in the North Sea are, or sorry, the albatross chick deaths are due to plastic. And um, they did a study of fulmars in the North Sea and found that 95% of them had plastic in their gut contents. Unfortunately, seabirds aren't the only ones that get it. Um, this is a picture of a lanternfish. Uh, these are mesopelagic fish that live um, in the Pacific. This one's sampled from the Pacific. So these fish live at about 700 meters depth, where it's dark. They come up to feed at night when their predators can't see them. Um, and because they're feeding at night, they don't really see what they're eating. Um, unfortunately, these guys seem to have a pension for those, those nurdles. They really like them. Um, and CPLEX did find that 9% um, of the fish that they studied out there contained plastic and that the average um, number of pieces of plastic was two pieces of plastic. So if you can imagine, like, this thing is only about this big. So two little nurdles in it um, would take up, like, the whole stomach, I would think. I mean, I'm not a fish biologist, but it just doesn't seem possible. Um, it's been estimated that uh, about 20,000 um, tons of plastic is eaten by fish in the Pacific every year. Um, and this is a particular interest because um, these fish are eaten by large uh, predatory fish like tuna, uh, so the plastic just gets passed on. So it's usually planktivorous um, fish which um, end up with plastic in their gut contents, but then um, predators will end up with large gut contents of plastic due to um, eating these fish. Um, I should mention that ingestion also bothers uh, benthic um, animals in areas, not in the deep sea because I haven't really studied that, but in coastal areas where they've looked at, at the seafloor, um, animals either get smothered or um, have problems with ingestion. So um, that's like sea, anemone sea anemones, sea stars, cucumbers, all that kind of thing. Ah, this, I, this is my favorite. Well, I, I'm not sure I should say it's a favorite because that makes it sound good, but um, 
this is my, I think this is the most interesting, which is that uh, plastics carry lots of chemicals. Um, and there's sort of twofold, so this problem is twofold. There's two parts to it. One is that um, plastics have additives. Um, so it's not just the original parent chemical. In fact, in the US, they add 90 different chemicals to plastics. Um, and this is because they want to make them clear or colored or opaque. They want them to be flexible. They want them to be rigid. Um, they often add sunscreens like uh, to avoid UV degradation. Um, and flame retardants to plastics. So there's all sorts of things in all sorts of plastics. Um, probably the most um, well-known of these are bisphenol A, uh, nonalphenols, and phthalates, um, because those are all known um, to be either carcinogens or give reproductive issues in humans. Um, so that's definitely a concern. I guess the, the concern with additives leaching out of plastic is that um, they will either be bioconcentrated or uh, bioaccumulated in animals. So either that means they eat plastic, and the more plastic they eat, the higher the concentration is in their bodies, or they eat plastic and then something eats them, which means then that contaminant moves up the food chain. The other possibility um, with similar um, results is pollutants. Um, so if you've got an oil spill, um, this might be the answer to the Deepwater Horizon, I'm not sure. Um, or you've got um, uh, halogenated um, carbon, uh, carbon molecules, so things like pesticides um, or flame retardants or PCBs. Um, they are absorbed by plastic and then they're re-released whenever they come out in contact with other um, non-water-based substances. So things like um, fats, um, it will, uh, it will uh, desorb into the fats. So I just want to talk a little bit here about um, bisphenol A. That's this molecule here. I'm sure most people have heard about it. It was taken out of water bottles. There was a big hoo-ha about having it in baby water bottles um, a few years ago. Did anybody hear about this? Yes. No, I put you to sleep. <laughs> um, this, uh, this chemical is very interesting. Uh, it's put in almost all the plastics that we come into contact with. It was put in polycarbonate water bottles. It's put in um, trays that you get your food in at the supermarket. Um, it, uh, they did a study recently in North America and found out that 93% of adults had high concentrations of bisphenol A in their blood. Um, so we obviously get it from a lot of different places. Um, it's... Uh, a, a cancer-causing agent causes uh, tumors, mammary tumors, and it also causes uh, reproductive issues, things like um, early onset of puberty. Um, so uh, there is quite a lot of concern about bisphenol A, um, and it has been removed. A lot of countries have decided to take it out of plastic that's used for baby products, um, but not all of them. And the UK hasn't, interestingly enough. Um, on the other side, on the pollutant side, uh, this guy Ogata does some really interesting work studying all different kinds of um, uh, pesticides, and this one's PCBs, looking at uh, concentrations that are in beached pellets, so um, plastic that they find on the beaches. And you can see they found PCBs um, everywhere across the globe, except South America. I'm not sure if they just haven't studied it or if there was nothing there. Um, so you can kind of see that PCBs have sort of been found um, in all sorts of far-flung places and not so far-flung places. Um, the co concentration of PCBs is, of course, proportional to usage in the area. Um, these are kind of interesting because PCBs is one of the few chemicals that's been tested uh, to take, like, we know that it is definitely taken up into plastics, and then we know that plastics that are contaminated with it um, then cause uptake in um, shear waters. It's been tested on shear water chicks. And um, it's been found that shear waters um, absorb the PCBs into their fat, and then when they lay eggs, the PCB is then transferred into their eggs. So that's one of the, the few contaminants that we've actually sort of done a step-by-step -step analysis of. Uh, lastly, we have alien species. Um, was anybody here last month for Moria's talk on aliens in the Solent? It was great. Um, we have this problem also um, with plastics in the ocean. And I grant that there is a glass bottle in this picture in addition to two plastic ones. It's not just plastic's fault. But um, the problem we have is that uh, plastic that remains near the coast is colonized by um, different fauna, and then as it's transported around the Earth due to currents, um, those fauna go with it. Um, so we have several uh, known cases of um, intrus alien intrusive species which have um, made a new home. Uh, in Florida, they've got problems with bryzoans that came from the Caribbean that have moved up there now. Um, we know 
in places like Ascension Island down in the south that about 40% of the plastic that lands, lands on their beach is colonized with an alien species. Um, it's much worse in places like the Seychelles, which get currents that come during some of the year from Australia and other parts of the year from Africa and some other parts of the year from India. They have more than 60% of the plastic that lands on their beach is covered in alien species. Um, so it's a real battle for them to keep them out. Uh, on another note, sort of alien species related, um, the plastic, because it's a nice hard substance, introduces a new um, substrate into the ocean because in the middle of the ocean there isn't really anything hard. So um, there are cases out in the Pacific of corals colonizing uh, plastic bottles which end up in the convergence zone and they bring with them reef fish. So there's little, little colonies of reef fish out in the middle of the Pacific that have come from Hawaii and also some from the coast of California. And there's also been a study done recently showing that um, marine insects like water striders have uh, laid their eggs on plastic and it has floated out to the middle of the Pacific and the, as eggs have remained viable. So we've got um, all sorts of new species coming out to different places that they aren't used to being in. So, okay, that's the end of the sadness for now. Uh, let's talk about some solutions. Um, the most obvious solution is um, why don't we just clean it up. Let's just take the plastic out of there. This is a picture of a manta troll that is used to collect samples of uh, plastic, um, mostly has been used in the Pacific. Um, and the answer is that it's not really practical. And it's not practical for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the problem is so diffuse that in order to clean up the plastic, I think they estimated it would take like 68 ship days just to do one section of the Pacific plastic convergence zone. And then you'd have to start again, of course, because the currents don't stop working um, while you're trying to clean it up. So the amount of uh, petrol and time and um, other resources that would be used to clean it up would, is astronomical. Secondly, um, when they trawl for plastic, they also pull up plankton and all sorts of other little species. So you would be ridding that portion of the ocean of that biota at the same time. Um, so that's kind of morally questionable. So um, for that reason, this has mostly been, been ruled out. Um, a couple of years ago, a Dutch company came up with this idea to deal with it in situ, and they said, let's just build an island. Why don't we just injection mold the plastic together, and then we can go live on it. Um, which was largely um, unfounded. That was based on that misconception that it is already a big rubbish island and we just need to glue it together. Um, but you can see, like, they put an amazing amount of work into this. Look at the land planning here. They've already divided up agricultural areas. They figured out who's going to live where and <coughs> argued over the beach huts. Um, there's a second, a second uh, interesting design like this. This actually won a design award last year. This is the way to clean it up. And their idea was they build this sphere and it's going to have a fence around it, a mile around the outside of it. And it's, the fence will channel all the plastic down this ramp. And the plastic will eventually, you can see we've got bottles and all sorts of stuff here, will get ground up somewhere in this conveyor belt system. And then there'll be a heat mold up this, uh, this shaft here. And at the top, they'll be able to take out plastic bricks which they can then use to build their houses on it. And so the city will live on the platform on the surface of the water, and they'll just build houses with all the plastic they collect, um, which seems like a great idea, except there isn't really um, the quantity of plastic they need to do that. I think they were hoping for 44 million kilos or something like that, um, which is a lot of plastic. But maybe they could use this in a lake somewhere or um, somewhere close to shore, maybe in Manila, you know, close to the uh, first photo. So unfortunately, the solutions um, are not finished yet. There's a, a project called Project KSI, which is um, being run also out of scripts, looking at um, different ways to deal with the plastic problem out there. But because it's so intertwined with biota, um, that's, a, that's a real problem deciding what to do about it. Most people, however, agree that one of the big solutions is not to put plastic in the ocean to begin with. Uh, and a lot of people have taken on the idea that since 80% of the plastic or 80% of the debris in the ocean, which is 90% plastic, comes from land-based sources, that um, that's something we can really, we can do something about. Uh, so I thought I'd put up some of these pictures here for inspiration. This man on the left here, Mike Biddle, 
um, he has just built a giant plastics recycling plant. A lot of people say plastic is really difficult to recycle because there's you know six, seven different types, and we have to do all this mechanical separation. To, you know, your electronics, how do we separate the plastic bits from the metal bits and all that kind of thing? Uh, well, he's a mining engineer, and he's applied mining techniques to it, um, and he has been very, success very successful. He's got one plant <laughs> running in Austria. Um, right now, um, and he has managed to cut down the energy use that he, the energy use for him to recycle plastic is uh, less than half of the energy required to make virgin plastic that's the same. Um, so that's uh, quite an exciting idea. Um, this man on the bottom is a Japanese man who has made uh, turn your plastic into oil on your own kitchen counter machine, which is what that is. Still incredibly expensive, but you can take your plastic water bottles and make them into oil, and then he puts the oil into his car and runs it on it. Um, so it's kind of a neat idea. If he could make it a bit cheaper, that might be viable. Um, this woman on the right, whose name is Beth Terry, uh, she's an interesting woman because she's trying to live her life without plastic. Um, she started a blog in 2007 and photographs every week all the plastic that she uses. And she's got it down so that um, in all of 2011, she used less than one kilo of plastic in the entire year, which um, is pretty amazing considering um, at the beginning of the talk I mentioned that we, on average, use 84 kilos. So um, she's got a wooden toothbrush. Um, she makes her own ketchup so she doesn't have to buy it in plastic bottles. She goes to the dairy and to the butchers with her own um, fabric and metal containers. Um, She's pretty serious about this. It's, it's quite inspiring to read, um, to read what she's done. She's very committed. Um, yeah, so those, those are some possibilities. I would maybe say another possibility is to work on the um, compostable plastic that we have now. Sometimes you'll get those like corn um, uh, sort of pseudo plastic drinking cups that are supposed to be recyclable, or you get um, carrier bags that say they're compostable. They're really only compostable at um, very specific conditions. So they must be like, covered in soil and they have to be done at this temperature and all that kind of thing, which generally means they're not very practical, practical to be compo composted at home. They mostly work in uh, industrial composters. So uh, there's definitely some work that could be done on that front to reduce our dependency on that. I know um, the Republic of Ireland um, implemented a charge on carrier bags back in 2002 or 2003. And I think now they charge 22 cents or something for a carrier bag. It's quite expensive. Um, but they saw an immediate um, drop in the number of carrier bags that they have. Um, and I know that that's something that's being looked at being done here as well. So I just thought uh, to end it up, I might show some websites, because I had a few people ask me before about this, um, in case you want to jot them down, if there's something you want to look up afterwards. Uh, the first one is the website for CFLEX. That's the um, uh, group, the project through Scripps Oceanographic Institution that's looking at plastic in the ocean. Uh, second is Project KSI, which is looking at solutions to that problem, also through the same institution. Uh, the third one is the website for the Marine uh, Conservancy Society in the UK, in case you want to get involved in beach cleanups or you want to find out what nasty things they found on the beach last year. Um, and then I've also uh, put up two websites at the bottom. The, the plast My Plastic Free Life is that woman who's living without plastic. And the very bottom one is the uh, UN regulatory uh, material that they're putting through on Marine Litter. So I think I've bored you for definitely long enough now. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So thank you very much to Jen. Do we have questions? I'm sure we do. We always have questions. I can't actually see anybody because the light will stand over here. Yep, at the back. Yep. I see a lot of pictures of things you know, caught in them, and it's always quite sad. But then I think about all the nets that are actually being used to actively kill things, and um, generally how our oceans get hammered from every aspect of plastic. How do you think this sort of plastic pollution and drifting plastic, how do you think that stacks up with the scheme of how we interact by us? Just to repeat the question, um, or some of it anyway, for our, for our listeners at home. Um, how does sort of, I guess, ghost fishing and drift netting and all that fit into the general global context of perspective when it comes to our hammering of the planet? 
Um, so that's a good question. You're right, as an oceanographer, it's pretty depressing to think about ocean acidification, overfishing, whaling, um, mercury contamination, what, nuclear waste dumps, um, what have I missed, coral bleaching, uh, climate change. Yeah, anyway, so you get the idea. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for quantifying that. I mean, I'm sure some things like climate change are probably that's more impending doom than this. Um, but the thing I think about plastic pollution is this is like a really easy problem for us to prevent. I mean, you know, for me to go to the shop with a fabric bag instead of a plastic bag and then not throwing it out or making sure the plastic that I do use definitely goes to the recycling place and doesn't, you know, wind up on the street or in a drainage area or in the in a riverbed somewhere. That's, that's like, that's pretty easy to do. Um, and the amount of rubbish that they clean up on the beaches every year alone just shows me that, you know, that's a small step towards fixing this problem. So I guess it's hard as an oceanographer to um, dwell on the problems of the planet. Maybe just like the fact that it, this is something we can do something about, I think, puts it up on the list for me. More questions for Jen? No more questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Talking about plastic and domestic use and so on. Um, one of the things that we are encouraged to do is to line our paddle fins with plastic bags and in order to keep our rubbish together and we dispose of it. And that is a problem, isn't it? We're actually introducing it to landfill sites that way, but what is the alternative to um, um, so, sorry, for, for the people at home, we're watching this retrospectively. Um, how do we overcome using bin liners, which are plastic? Uh, in some places, I know it's not allowed in Southampton, but in some places you're allowed to use paper bags instead, which then decompose. Um, or having communal, communal bins. I lived in Bristol for a while and there wasn't enough space on the street for everybody to have their own bin. It would have just been like more bins than um, pavement. So um, we just had communal bins for a larger group of people, which meant um, smaller volumes of plastic because we weren't, you know, pitching out bags that were only partly full. It was only getting taken when they were fully full. So that's one way of reducing the amount of plastic that's in there. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Definitely. There's a question at the end. Oh, yeah. Uh, I suppose the advantage of that is that these are inert substances. Plastic, from what you say, is not inert. Would there be an argument, for example, making plastic which was not degradable? In other words, the problem, you have a problem of, of alien transference and things, but if you had a, a non-degradable plastic, it would be obvious, because this is a cruise city, so I've never heard anyone say to me, on the cruises that they noticed lots of tiny little bits of plastic floating in the ocean. So you've got an invisible or a partially invisible problem. Mm -hmm. So you've really got a complex way to maneuver your way through to solve this problem. Plus, of course, the money is the petrochemical industry is put into developing these plastics and new plastics. So uh, I could see that's my main point is would it be is there any advantage to having non-degradable plastics so that they don't break up in the ocean and sink? So is there any sort of advantage to having non-degradable plastics um, that don't add to the chemicals in the ocean? Um, I think yes, there might be an advantage. Uh, the difficulty with that, um, in addition to those you mentioned about um, the cost of the plastic and the kind of economy that runs on plastic, is that um, you'd, you'd lose a lot of the... Um, flexible properties of plastic. If you're going to make it non-degradable, it would be something more like uh, PVC, like you have in, in pipes and things like that, which um, is more easily smashed, but less flexible. So you wouldn't have you know, squeezy honey bottles, and you probably wouldn't have the plastic that you put water bottles into. Um, but definitely some legislation on what, what can go into plastics and what can not go into plastics would be quite useful, um, particularly in parts of the world that produce the most plastic. Um, so even just removing some of the additives would solve that chemical carrier problem. And um, if you could make it so that it broke into larger pieces or something, then it probably wouldn't be ingested by as many, as many animals. Yeah, that's a good idea. It was a question on the end. There's recent evidence that contaminants from Fukushima have already entered the food chain on 
West Coast of America in particular. How much research has been done as to the plastics and the contaminants from the plastics actually entering the food chain? So what do we know about plastics entering the food chain as chemical contaminants for humans? Um, we do know that um, in the case of bisphenol A, um, which is used as an antioxidant um, in plastic bottles, um, that that polycarbonate bottles, I should say specifically, that um, they went and tested all the fish and other kinds of seafood at Singapore fish markets a few years ago, and there wasn't a single item that didn't contain concentrations of um, BPA. So we do know um, that that food was all for human consumption. I don't know what the statistics are or what the science is related to the consumption of that BPA contaminated fish and how that transfers physiologically into the human body, but I do know that they're, they're working on that. Um, they haven't assessed it. The other way that it has been looked at is um, with uh, PCBs, I think, in um, shear waters and also with contaminants um, on the, you know, I was talking about the, um, those little mesopelagic lanternfish um, eating nurdles. Well, contaminated nurdles uh, have then been found in tuna that have eaten these lanternfish. So they are looking, I mean, in some aspects of the food web, they haven't made the whole linkage yet. It's a bit tough with things like um, bisphenol A, for example, because they could examine um, the bisphenol A in the fish, and then they could examine it in humans, but there are so many other ways that humans get bisphenol A right now that I think maybe to be able to isolate that as a particular pathway would be very difficult. Do we have any further questions? Um, okay, I have a question for Jen. It's a nice easy one. Um, <laughs> if you had, I don't know, maybe three tips for people in the audience today or at home on how to cut down their plastic usage easily to help alleviate this problem, what would you do? Um, I would say, uh, first one is cut out plastic drinks bottles from your life. So don't buy bottled water, don't buy bottled juice, don't buy bottled Coke, whatever. Um, carry a container with you, and um, if you don't have the container with you, then don't have a drink. Um, <laughs> which, uh, um, you know, seems kind of harsh, but we're kind of adults. We can sort of um, get around that. Um, secondly, uh, get rid of carrier bags from your life. I know that that's a big campaign that's on right now, um, and uh, that's definitely an attainable one. Um, and the third one would be um, stopping to use uh, ready meals. Those are a massive source of plastic. They all come with plastic film on top, and they come in a plastic tray. And um, so ready meals and, and takeaways. Uh, if you get a takeaway, take them. Uh, you know, when you go to pick it up, take a casserole dish and get them to put it in there or something. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, but lastly, I'd say, I would say don't beat yourself up about it. I thought there's a great quote by um, Beth Terry, the woman who's managed to reduce plastic almost entirely from her life in five years. And she said, sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail. Sometimes I'm a lot preachier than I mean to be. And afterwards, I feel like a jerk. Really, I'm no different from anyone else who cares about the planet. Okay, I think... On that note, before we say thank you to Jen, finally, um, you can also get involved in beach cleanups. I know that the MCS run quite a few, um, so either you can get involved in <coughs> one that's already been organised, or go get it off the beach yourself. You know, if you want, a few of you can go and just grab some plastic and remove it and dispose of it sensibly. So, thank you very much, Jen. <laughs>